Okay, so uh, I thought I'd make just a couple of logistical announcements. Uh, this is the second to last class. We have one more remaining, and that'll be next Monday. Um, and we uh, decided not to give you a homework on the last lecture's material. Hopefully you'll just figure it out on your own. Uh, so this will be the last homework that you'll get uh, today at the end of uh, the class. The second thing is on the final project, which, as you know, is due May 10th. And we had um, sort of two ideas for this, as you'll remember from the first lecture. One was to build a substantial framework for doing something of your, kind of in the realm of your own research. And what we'd like for you to do is draw from the lessons of at least two of the lectures uh, over the semester. So maybe you're interested in building a GUI and doing some you know, fitting of data. You know, you'll learn about fitting of data uh, today. Maybe you're interacting with an instrument and you want to save data to um, some big database. This should be something that I think uh, has the amount of um, thinking and coding involved, maybe a class and a half worth of homework. Um, but uh, what we ask you to do is to essentially vet it with us. If you haven't already, send us a, you know, a few lines just of, of, in an email saying what it is that you're interested in doing and what sort of application you're thinking about and what's the scope of it. If you say, I want to write a new GUI toolkit, we'll be like, no. If you say, I want to make a new widget that shows a picture of a dog, and then when you click on the quit button, it quits, we'll say no. So it's the geometric mean somewhere in between those two things that you should be um, aiming for. And what we really want, because this, this course has been about teaching you uh, Python tools that will allow you to do your own work more efficiently, we want you to build something that you're actually going to be able to use in your daily research life. And um, if you're having trouble coming up with, a, with uh, some ideas, you can talk to us and we'll be happy to pitch a few. Um, that's one sort of branch of possibilities. And I think the lion's share of what uh, people generally wind up doing in the course is, is that. The other possibilities contribute uh, some sort of major um, functionality or some level of functionality to some open source framework. So for instance, if you've been really bugged that uh, there's some really cool thing in MATLAB that's just awesome and it doesn't exist in matplotlib, then you can just say, I want to do this. Now this isn't just building that code that, build, that lives on top of matplotlib. Part of your uh, grade will be how you interact with the, the community that you're going to wind up um, dumping this code on. So you'll have to get on the mailing list. You'll have to say, what do you guys think about this? Other people have to give you, you know, sort of feedback. You code something up, you maybe do a git pull on the whole thing, and then you branch something off. And then at some point, you're going to um, request to get merged back into the main branch. Um, you, you're welcome to do that. And uh, it'd be really awesome if you want to get into that. Uh, as you know, through lectures like with, with uh, Fernando and, and Paul and, and Stefan, there's a huge sort of open source initiative um, at Berkeley. And so you'll also get a lot of help from people on, um, on actually how to do that. And I'm sure they'd be more than willing to sort of walk you through that process. So um, let us know. And I think just to put some specificity here, it'd be good if by, um, say, next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, you have sent us an email and more or less iterated with us on what your final project is going to wind up being so that you have some time to work on it. And of course, all of us are willing to answer questions. So if you have a specific question from one of the lecturers, you could say, hey, Joey, I didn't understand um, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, can you tell me what, how to do this better? Or can I show you some code? And we can all sort of help you um, as need be. Are there any questions? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it would be good to be able to do uh, a demo. And if we can just run it by ourselves, that's great. As you know, that's what we like to do with the homework. But um, if it's something that really needs to have access to a special database, or it's really a workflow that you're interested in, in having and you don't think many others would, or maybe just your research group, in principle, you could just do a screen capture 
uh, where you're doing a voiceover of, so here's what my functionality is and here's what I'm doing. And you know, if, we're, if, if we don't know what's happening under the hood, obviously send, you'll have to send us all your code and everything. But it, um, if we don't understand what's happening or we can't reproduce enough of it, then maybe we'll ask to just sit down with you and just look over your shoulder. That would be totally fine, yeah. I mean, in the end, it'd be nice to sort of think about an envelope around this project where you actually have a setup.py file, you're doing you, using dist utils, you've got a readme, you've got subdirectories, so that you could actually you know, start this as a project on GitHub, and then maybe it's still private for a while, but eventually you might want to release it to a wider community. That'd be that would be great. OK. So that's it. I'll, I'll leave it uh, to Barian. That goes on. OK, thanks, Josh. All right, so uh, this lecture is about Python for scientific inference, and Joey and I will present uh, the material. So this is sort of a continuation from uh, what we spoke about in lecture four, if you can cast your mind back, when we discuss stats models, uh, machine learning, scikits. Um, but it goes in, down a different path, uh, particularly down the path of Bayesian inference, which is something we're going to talk about quite a bit today. Okay. So the overview for the lecture is as follows. I'm going to start out by introducing tools for symbolic computation in Python. So there are there's the SymPy package, which is what I'll talk about in detail. And then there's also uh, a separate, very large uh, project called Sage, which is independent of Python, but based on Python. So it's basically a Python interpreter, but it has stands alone. It has a, a notebook functionality and has existed for, for, for uh, more than five years now. Um, I won't be talking so much about that, so we're going to focus on SymPy, but we're going to talk about generally symbolic computation frameworks, uh, what they do, and how uh, progress is being made with that you know, in Python. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about uh, Bayesian inference generally. One of the pieces of feedback that Joey and I had after the earlier lecture was that maybe we, we covered some of the theoretical material on stats and machine learning a bit briskly, so we are going to spend a bit more time on uh, statistical ideas uh, while introducing these topics in Python. But uh, we'll both try to gauge based on how you guys are getting along in the lecture and with the breakout exercises about whether we're going too slow or too fast. But please do, please do ask questions. Uh, okay, and so that uh, leads up to a discussion of uh, Bayesian inference packages in Python, particularly MC and PyMC, which Joey will be talking about uh, at the end. Okay, so that's the overview for today. So let's start off by discussing symbolic computation in Python. Uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about SymPy, the SymPy package. So if you have a Python or IPython uh, or notebook uh, open, please start by typing import SymPy. And if you get an error, a module error, then you might need to install SymPy, but hopefully you won't. OK, so uh, SymPy is a symbolic mathematics project, uh, and it allows uh, it's still in development. It's still at an early stage of its development, but it's extremely promising development um, that allows for uh, symbolic computation in the style of Mathematica or Maple, if you're familiar with those tools. In fact, can I have a show of hands? Has anyone worked extensively with Maple or Mathematica before, or even non-extensively? So you're all generally familiar with what those are and how they differ from something like MATLAB, for instance. MATLAB is a numerical toolbox, whereas these are symbolic computation. Okay, so. The home page and the, um, the reference page are pretty well filled out. So there's a lot of information in there that is extremely readable and extremely useful. And during the short breakout uh, we'll have after this symbolic section, we'll probably be using some of the material in there. Okay. So as I've put on the slide here, it's, it's okay maybe to think of SymPy as sort of Mathematica for Python. Um, with the, the advent of the IPython notebook now, there's this extremely uh, good interface for doing symbolic computation with cells that you can type in little bits of code and execute code. Um, 
and the modules that SymPy provides, like integration geometry, this is just a sample, linear algebra statistics, also ODE solving and te uh, tensor algebra, are, are really pretty, pretty robust. So there's a lot you can do with this package, and we'll go through some of it. Uh, in addition to the doc pages, the GitHub repository has actually got loads of information in it, and the wiki on the GitHub page has a great deal of interesting information that's not so much covered in the, in the other documentation. Yeah, in particular, uh, these three, three pages, if you're coming to SymPy from uh, other languages or other packages like Mathematica, Maple, MATLAB, or a bunch of others that exist, these are ways you can sort of see what's different and what's the same. So um, symbolic computation uh, and computer algebra systems have uh, existed since the 1960s uh, and initially were developed primarily within the theoretical physics and AI communities until uh, around the 1980s when Maple and, and Mathematica took off. And since then, uh, they're sort of very uh, independent industrial companies that are aiming to uh, really stand alone with these, uh, these uh, software packages that they provide. Uh, and so those packages are uh, extremely useful, and as you know, you've used them before. Many problems in symbolic computation, however, remain unsolved, uh, and a lot of the problems that have been posed uh, have also been solved on paper but, but not implemented. And uh, integration is a, a great example of that. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Um, there are some, th I mean, there's journals devoted to symbolic computation and mathematical software. There's two entire archive subcategories devoted to these topics, so it's extremely uh, active. These are within mathematics or within computer science, rather. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of active development going on uh, right now. And there's a lot of really interesting questions in these areas as well. Okay, so let's, let's talk about um, what SymPy aims to provide. So <clears throat> it aims to provide representations of mathematical objects. And uh, everything is uh, starting out with this, this very abstract class, BASIC, from which uh, all other mathematical objects, like you know, variable symbols like X, or matrices or functions are derived. So if, if you have a very broad view of mathematics, you think there are these very general objects that exist abstractly within mathematics. And then the things that we commonly encounter in, in, uh, in science or in mathematics, like functions and so on, are derived from those. So uh, one difference between SymPy and regular Python use is that all variables which are going to be used symbolically have to be declared as such in advance. So, um, for instance, if you want to use x in an equation, you would write x equals symbol x. We'll see that in a moment. And then you would, you would say y equals x squared or some, something like that. Uh, from the command line, however, not from within the Python interpreter, you can run isympy, which um, generates, uh, it sort of opens a Python or IPython session uh, with a number of things pre-imported, pre uh, I mean, principal. As you can see, there's basically a lot of things pre-imported. SymPy is a big package. Um, but it also pre-declares symbols. So these represent uh, general pronumerals. These represent integers. Uh, and these represent functions. So these are just conventions that we use. OK. The SymPy core package is what provides all of this sort of abstract mathematical framework in which symbolic computation takes place. The actual modules for tasks like integration or linear algebra are separate within SymPy. And so uh, this page gives uh, a list. I haven't put down the list because it's quite long. There are a lot of modules that are already available and a lot more that could be written. But we're going to use some of them. OK, so let's, um, let's talk about integration briefly. So the, the question. Uh, for symbolic computation regarding integration is if I give you a function, uh, if I give the computer a function, how is it supposed to return uh, an integral or an antiderivative of that function? And so the idea uh, for solving this question goes back to, to Liouville. I'm sure it goes back further than that, but to Liouville in the in, uh, late <clears throat> 19th century. And uh, it was only in, in around the middle of the 20th century that uh, ideas like the Risch algorithm were fully spelled out. So the Risch algorithm 
basically decides, it's a decision procedure for working out whether the given expression has an antiderivative. As a byproduct of that decision, if there is an antiderivative, it returns it. And so that's how symbolic integration works in basically every symbolic computation package. So the full RISH algorithm has never been implemented. It's extremely complicated. Uh, Mathematica uh, is a fairly complete implementation, um, but I mean, I'm sure you've used the online integrator or the integrate within Mathematica before, uh, and it, I'm sure, has a lot of inbuilt like proprietary uh, techniques that they use for integrating. Within SymPy, uh, a restricted implementation of this Risch algorithm called the Risch Norman algorithm uh, is what's used. So it's fast, but it doesn't cover everything. Okay. Um, Axiom, which is uh, a different computer algebra system that I don't have a lot of experience with, is I think the only system that uh, implements RISH, maybe not completely, but almost like m further than, than any other system. So, and that's active development. So this is still an, an open problem. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, if you've uh, run iSymPy, you could type this command in, for instance, and it would return the integral of x on x squared plus 2x plus 1 with respect to x. <clears throat> Normally one would have to declare x as a symbol in advance, but if you've loaded isympy, then x has already been declared as a symbol. And if you type that in, hopefully you will get output that looks like that. So that's uh, an example of, of integration. So, uh, does anyone have any general questions about integration? We're going to be doing more of that shortly. So, yeah. so sorry, I didn't catch. Does it mean that if you implemented Reach completely and it said uh, it, it doesn't have an antiderivative, that it's proven that there is no antiderivative? That, that, that is the full Reach algorithm. Yeah. It, it, so, if you know a function like x to the x, yeah. <coughs> it would say this, this does not have uh, an antiderivative. Whereas if you put that into, like, SymPy, well, I, I don't know what happens, but it won't be pretty. It, it'll probably, at best, it will just sit there running for a while, I think. Try it. Try it, yeah. It just returns the integral of x to the x. Ah, okay. All right. So, yes, it, that's, that's graceful behavior, yeah. If it can't, so in, if SymPy, it, yeah, so if SymPy, if SymPy can't, um, so it must have decided that, that that can't be integrated, and then it returns just an expression showing you the integral. But it, I know from experience it is possible and not difficult to give SymPy an expression to integrate where it can't decide and just sits there running. But, I, I, but you know, things will develop. It will get better. OK, so uh, SymPy also provides uh, linear algebra and matrix computation. So this is kind of conjugate to what NumPy provides. NumPy is a great numerical array framework, but uh, there are also matrices implemented in NumPy, but we tend not to use them very often. Um, this is a bit more fully featured, I guess. Uh, so typing in this command, for instance, will generate uh, a matrix. And you can perform matrix multiplication. So this is a three by three matrix of, of those numbers. And you can perform matrix multiplication by typing n times n. And there you go. <coughs> we'll print out something like this. Uh, I have a comment on the notation. You note matrix, of course, is a function, so it has parentheses. But then there are some sub parentheses here. These could also be square brackets. Doesn't make a difference. I think. I think this is just a simpy convenience, the inset parentheses, because it, it looks nicer when you've got when you don't have lots of square brackets. I don't think that would work, for instance, if you were declaring a numpy array that way. Is, are the elements of that matrix? I don't know the answer to that. I presume, yeah, no, they are, they are. Yeah, absolutely. So it's weird to declare it as a two Exactly, so yeah. No, exactly. So, you know, so formally, formally, it's, yeah, exactly. You, if, if you're thinking of it as a list of lists, yeah. then it, it should be square brackets. And that's sort of what it is. So, yeah. but it, it, maybe it's just easier to keep track of, I get lost declaring two-dimensional arrays using square brackets. So it's useful to be able to do that. Uh, and so 
uh, of course, anything that works um, with, with, with numbers, uh, that's not, the numbers aren't the point of SymPy, it's the symbols that are the, that are the purpose. And so if you declare, for instance, x and y as symbols and put them in a matrix, you can compute the determinant of, or you can compute any property of that matrix and it should return an expression involving those symbols. So that's the determinant. You might also ask for the inverse or Cholesky decomposition or anything. <clears throat> And uh, another, useful, uh, another useful routine is the dot subs routine, which allows you to substitute for all instances of some variable a number. So if you've declared M as this matrix, you could type M dot subs, open parentheses, X comma three, and that would replace all instances of X in the matrix with three. And so this is useful if you're trying to build up really generic uh, functions based on these numerical objects. So SymPy also provides, I, I should say, we're going to do a bit more of actually looking at these functions in the notebook uh, just after I finish these, these slides. So I just wanted to cover a few of the packages uh, which are going to be useful for us throughout this uh, discussion of inference. So uh, yeah, SymPy also provides SymPy.statistics, a module for doing some statistical uh, work with statistical distributions. So <clears throat> uh, its goal in the long term is to provide uh, a very full range of abstract structures representing probability distributions. At the moment, only two such uh, probability distributions are implemented, the univariate normal distribution and the uniform distribution. But there is an underlying API in simpy.statistics.distributions which allows you to declare more general PDFs of your own devising. So you could declare, you could make an exponential PDF that way. Sorry, when I say PDF, I mean probability distribution function. This is one of these questions I need to ask to make. Is everyone comfortable with the idea of probability distributions and, and so on? Or if, if you're not, chat to me during the breakout and we'll, we'll make sure that you have one. <laughs> sure. Here's a uniform distribution. Here's a normal distribution. X. P of X. So a probability distribution for our purposes is some function that integrates from minus infinity to infinity to give one. All right, so uh, in SymPy, if you want to declare, for instance, uh, a particular normal distribution, you run n equals normal mu comma sigma. And so that defines the mean and standard deviation of the normal distribution. So this would give this would uh, be a normal distribution which has a mean at 1 and has width parameter sigma of 1. And so uh, if you want to evaluate the PDF at a particular value, you go ahead and do that and it returns Is that to that. particular version of... Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I didn't... Go on. Is no, I didn't think I didn't import it from my... Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So from from SymPy import star will not import everything. So maybe import SymPy dot statistics as something, or from SymPy dot statistics import star. I I get concerned about. It's dangerous to do from x import star, but it happens, like many things in life. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Paul, did you want to add something? No, you're agreeing. You're coughing your agreement with me. Yeah. Uh, okay, so hopefully that, uh, that's fairly straightforward. Um, and so, so this uh, has returned like a, uh, an exact expression for the PDF. Uh, but you can also, if you want a numerical value, just uh, the dot eval f method will return a numerical expression There's to some significant figures. It can also accept an argument, which is the number of significant figures to which you would like it. So if you put eval f5, you'll get five significant figures. And so uh, symbolic computation uh, use within these is, is possible, of course. So now if you define x as a symbol, and if you ask for the CDF of the normal distribution as a function of a, a general symbol x, you'll get some ASCII art that looks like this. 
I'm going to discuss printing in a moment. Thank you, Chris. For the viewers at home, Chris was expressing his displeasure at the way the material looks in output. So we're going to have a look at a couple of ways of doing this. So if you're working in the terminal, which I think many of you will be, um, generally you won't, you probably won't get ASCII art, but you'll get something that looks kind of similar with like Unicode bracket things. So that's a little bit better, but not great. If you're working in the IPython notebook, which I will encourage you to in a moment, you have some other options as well. Um, all right, and so here I was just uh, evaluating the CDF uh, at a number of different values. Does everyone, can anyone guess what this is? What is OO? This. Uh, I, this is how you represent INF symbolically. In, I mean, I guess INF is numerical infinity. This is symbolic infinity. I, I. <laughs> so yes, if you evaluate uh, the CDF at those ranges, you'll get numbers. Uh, and of course, you can evaluate the CDF that way. <clears throat> They're the letter O, yeah. OK, output and rendering. Um, and so I'll switch to the notebook after this, I think. I think this is the last slide before the breakout. So I'll switch to the notebook after this, and we'll actually have a look at some of these. So uh, if you're in the terminal, then Unicode rendering is available using either by default or if you use pprint, pretty print, on a symbolic expression. So you could try that now if you type pprint and then some expression. It may not, may not look significantly different. Um, you can also get a variety of different outputs. For instance, if you run LaTeX on a symbolic expression, it'll return the LaTeX expression for that. So that's, that could be useful. Whether, uh, depending on how good you are at LaTeX, it, it might be quicker for me. <laughs> if I just type, it might, typing this generally will take me longer than typing this. But uh, over time, one could become quite proficient at this. Uh, also, Python printing is useful particularly if you're like me and you always forget to declare things as symbols in advance. So if I want to, you know, do this. So maybe I could even run like LaTeX on that and that would save me even more time. So those are two uh, output options. Okay, and then um, significantly within the IPython notebook, the load extension SymPy printing magic produces rendered LaTeX output. So let's, let's have a look at that now. <clears throat> in addition to some other things. Is that, does that all, that view's okay? Okay. So can I do full screen or something? Sorry? It's Firefox, so I have no idea how to. <laughs> it's for your benefit, Josh. All right, anyway, I think everyone can see it, right? All right. There we go. All right, okay. Okay, so some things to try out in SymPy. Uh, this expression, for instance, will not return what you think, return zero, or maybe it is what you think. This is uh, integer division of 1 on 2 plus 1 on 3. So this is just using Python's default integer division. You can import division from future. So, oh man, I don't even know if this is going to work, but I'll try. And so this actually uh, generates, uh, this turns the division operator into... Uh, what you would expect for symbolic computation. And you can get the old Python division operator back by doing this, I think. Okay. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, you would declare a half and a third as, as being rational expressions, which is what they are. And so... Uh, and of course, using uh, dots to declare things in natural Python works. Forwardly as well. And to be clear, the future is Python 3. Yeah, that's the, that's the aim. Okay. 
So uh, a number of uh, expressions for symbolic computation. You want to take the limit of sine x on x as x goes to 0, for example. It gives 1, which is correct. The derivative of the error function with respect to x is a Gaussian. Uh, and then some integral expressions, which we've seen already. <clears throat> so in the notebook, um, the default without loading any extensions is just these types of expressions. But if you use the load ext simpy printing magic, then you get rendered LaTeX output, which is nice. So this is the inverse of M. Uh, and it renders it. It's a bit small, unfortunately, but it looks very nice. And similarly with the Cholesky decomposition of that matrix. Is that okay? Cool. All right, so this is a short breakout on symbolic computation. So I, I only envisage spending 10 to 15 minutes. After that, we'll talk about inference generally, and there'll be a longer breakout after that, that section. So the purpose of this breakout is to just get you started playing with some of the tools in the symbolic computation toolbox. It's, so this question is deliberately open-ended, which the next breakout question will not be. So think of a way to implement the bivariate normal distribution in SymPy. At the moment, you've got the univariate normal distribution. But uh, the bivariate normal distribution, or you can look up this Wikipedia page to get an example of that. So, but I'll, I'll give an overview here. So a bivariate normal distribution is a two-dimensional distribution. Like a... A one-dimensional normal distribution has a mean, mu, which is a vector. And the width, let me try to draw this better, it's an ellipse. So here is x, y, and you can imagine this as being a one sigma contour. Has everyone seen something like this before? You know what I mean when I say bivariate normal distribution? Cool. So the mean is some x naught, y naught. And um, the width is specified by a two by two matrix. So in particular, you have widths in the x and y dimensions, but you also have the possibility of covariance between x and y. And so you need a matrix to represent the covariance matrix. Maybe you need a matrix to represent mu. Come up with some way to uh, implement some facet of the bivariate normal distribution using as much SymPy as you can. And I, I ask questions like, what functions are available to do such and such? Look in you know, tab completion in, in IPython and the module references online will go a long way to, to coming up with answers. OK, but let's spend about 10 to 15 minutes on this, OK?
Okay, so let's move on to the second part of the lecture today, which is an overview of Bayesian inference. So this is a tutorial in uh, inference, uh, and then that will lead up to Joey's final discussion of how these uh, inference ideas are implemented in different ways in Python packages. Um, yeah, again, to calibrate, how many people are aware of the distinction between frequentist and Bayesian inference, and how many people I don't think anyone in existence can claim to fully comprehend that distinction, but uh, maybe some of us are only aware of it and others are familiar with uh, the importance of the difference between... Okay, so, yeah, I, the, the purpose of this discussion is to highlight uh, different ways of approaching inference uh, in science. Okay, so as scientists, uh, the role of inference is to be able to draw... This is my characterization, anyway. A role of inference is to be able to draw quantitative conclusions from noisy data, okay, and... Uh, or uncertain data, data that are random variants is, is what's really meant there, okay? And so, uh, historically, approaches to inference can be divided into two, and I have a star here to remind me that, that of course, there's more than two, but no one ever talks about the other ones. Uh, two camps, terms frequentist and Bayesian, okay? And so, uh, the rule of, the, the, the one-line description of the difference between these two uh, views is that the frequentist interpretation of probability is expressed in terms of repeated trials, while uh, Bayesians interpret probability as a degree of belief. Now, that's easy to say, but it's not easy to comprehend exactly what that distinction means, what it leads to, and so we'll talk about, uh, uh, talk about what that means in a moment. Um, yes, some additional reading material if people are interested in history of... Uh, Statistical inference in court cases, which is Bayesian inference and its use in court cases is controversial uh, at, at present. Uh, but uh, statistical inference is very important. Okay, anyway, that was just an aside. So the methodological implications of the distinction between frequentist and Bayesian statistics are profound and, and subtle. The notion of hypothesis testing is, is largely drawn from frequentist statistics where propositions are to be evaluated um, as either true or false and perhaps with a possibility of their being false which is what a p-value for instance provides. Okay? On the other hand concepts that we'll discuss shortly like likelihood I'm not going to talk about evidence so much but likelihood in particular arise from within Bayesian statistics and it's important to understand what these tools are and what they uh, allow us to do when we are approaching the problem of here is the scientific data set, I want to draw some quantitative conclusions from it. So <clears throat> it's possible to make a lot of the distinction between Frequentist and Bayesian statistics. It's an interesting philosophical topic. Um, my impression, and I'm, I'm not deeply within the statistics community, but my impression is that it's not considered a major division uh, in statistics today. It was during much of the 20th century. Frequentism was uh, the prevailing viewpoint uh, in scientific discourse, and then it's only recently that Bayesian statistics have uh, become very widely used. So, for scientists who remember that division, I suppose there's still some rancor, but it was before my time, and so I think as scientists we have to be uh, pretty pragmatic. Nevertheless, <clears throat> um, the application of inference within scientific field is often surprisingly one-sided. Within uh, my own field, cosmology, Bayesian inference is, is standard. Um, in particle physics, I understand frequentist statistics uh, are the norm. Uh, and astronomy as a whole, my, my impression is that it's more, it's more mixed, like a mixture of both. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask whether people had impressions based on their own fields of whether one type, one... Sorry, pragmatically, besides saying which one <coughs> you prefer, how do you distinguish which camp you're in? Like, besides labeling so the question was, how does one distinguish oneself as a frequentist or a Bayesian with, apart, with, from, with apart from carrying a... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you're concerned with things like prior and posterior distributions for parameters, and when you approach inference Actually, problems... I think the, the biggest philosophical difference is that in Bayesian statistics, the parameter distributed randomly, the random variables are your parameters and your data are fixed, whereas the, the classical... Where does it make a difference? We will see. Like I can, okay. okay. And the types of tools that you 
So, so in most cases, they'll you know lead the same result practically. Okay. There are cases where they won't. I'm just trying to figure out which one my community is, and <laughs> the only my community is works. No other. Are we? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, com the computer science community poll. <laughs> okay. So to, to think about uh, approaches to statistical inference within science, <clears throat> ultimately the distinction between these two camps is not of the highest practical importance for, for us. The kinds of questions that matter to scientists are things like, I have these data uh, with some error bars that maybe I trust, maybe I don't. I want to publish in a journal. What do I do in between? Um, or more specifically, how do I fit a model to data? Uh, or decide which of two models is better. Uh, or even more specifically, which is what we're going to focus on, how do I take a NumPy array uh, and find you know, maximum likelihood parameters for some model and maybe an associated covariance matrix? OK, so let's, let's unpack this statement. The goal of this uh, lecture is to provide you with tools for inference with real data in Python. So we're interested in packages that interface with NumPy that allow you to use all of the fantastic tools that are available uh, in Python. We want to uh, find ways to return uh, optimized best fit parameters. We want to find, you know, uh, you, you want to find some numbers you can quote and say this is the value of the parameters. Uh, and you also want to have some uh, idea about the uncertainty and come up with a way of characterizing the uncertainty uh, in, in those uh, parameters. Okay, so that's uh, that's the goal. Does anyone have any questions? All right. All right. To answer that yeah. question, you just head up to the matter which camp you're in. Um, what it will change is the way you answer the question and what okay. things you think are important. In general, the numerical res results you get should not be different if you've done things correctly. But the things you emphasize, the sorts of conclusions, the way you interpret the okay. statistics from your data will differ greatly. Yeah. Uh, okay, so if you cast your minds back, uh, earlier in the course we did, uh, we talked about a number of packages that touch on these things, maybe not so explicitly. Stats models, uh, scikit-learn for machine learning in Python. I just wanted to mention those. Um, my, my impression is that these are more frequentist tools to give you some indication. And the two tools we're going to talk about today, PyMC and MC, are very Bayesian. Okay, so... <clears throat> I wanted to come up with one slide to describe all of Bayesian inference. This is that slide. <laughs> when embarking on an experiment, we almost always have some prior expectation about the outcome. So it could be, it could be a prejudice. And when people have like a negative view of Bayesianism, this is what they emphasize, that like science, sh they might say science should be sh subjective. So if two people come to an experiment with two different prejudices, two different starting viewpoints, with Bayesianism, they'll get two different answers, and that's bad. So I don't agree with that. I think that science is not perfectly objective. Uh, well, too, sure. You have to choose your way <coughs> to do it in your case. And the model, the, the model that you choose may be different mm -hmm. one case or another, or the, the, the penalization parameter, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. So Joey is making the point that even within frequentism, it's, it's possible to have to make these sorts of subjective decisions. The power of Bayesianism, perhaps, is the fact that it makes explicit these uh, assumptions that we are, we are putting in. Okay, so Bayesian inference is the process by which we update our expectations for parameter values or the distribution of a parameter to take account of new data that we've received. Okay, and so, you know, not our, our input our prior expectation for a parameter is, isn't always necessarily a prejudice. It could be the result of a previous experiment that some people have done. Okay, so last year an experiment was done. The mass of neutrinos was found to be this distribution of values with an uncertainty. Now we can do 
uh, a better experiment that returns values that are more precise. And so Bayesian inference, and inference generally, allows us to update uh, prior information into a posterior. And the single equation that does that, you should read it right to left, is you have a prior, so you're trying to infer the probability distribution for your parameter set. I just represents your prior information. I'm going to sort of not explicitly include that from here on, but it's important to understand that it's there. So you want to infer, this is your prior. You've got the parameter set given your previous information. And what you want to get is parameter set given this new data you have. And still, of course, the prior information has been incorporated. And the way you get there is using this expression. This in between is the likelihood, which is you have to evaluate the probability of getting your data given particular parameter set. We're going to talk about how to evaluate this uh, in, like for the next 10 slides when we're talking about this. So, but the point of this equation is just to make clear exactly how you're going to do what you're doing in Bayesian inference. You're, as a scientist, maybe you want to uh, derive a particular parameter value. You have something to begin with. You have new data. You're going to get a posterior. Okay? That's the essence of Bayesian inference in, in my view. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that? <clears throat> I, <clears throat> one thing I will add is that I, I put a proportionality sign here. There's a, the constant of proportionality is the evidence, P of D given I, but which from a formal standpoint has to be included. This is Bayes' theorem, Bayes' rule. Uh, but from a practical standpoint, I never worry about that because this has to be a probability distribution. What I, what I end up with is like a vector of numbers, for instance, which represents the probability distribution for theta. And then I just like take vector divided by sum so that it's normalized to one. So that, I mean, that's... Yeah, so there's, there's basically there's, there's no theta in the denominator. It's, it's the same expression on the top that's integrated over theta. Right. So then it doesn't depend right. on theta. Then, you know. Cool. Except when you do a model comparison. Then it's important, yeah. But I, I'm also going to say for MCMC, it's not. That's one of the benefits of MCMC is you don't have to worry about these things. Okay. So let's talk about what the likelihood is and how we evaluate it given a data set. So much of the work, uh, the practical work that we will do when analyzing a data set involves inferring parameter, parameter values from the data set. The likelihood distribution written L of theta, sometimes written L of theta given D, which is confusing because it's not the probability distribution for theta given the data, it's the other. So this is confusing. I try to avoid that notation because it confuses me. This, this, same thing. OK. So given a data set, how do I evaluate how likely a particular choice of parameters is given that data? That's what we're going to answer. So the way we do that is by understanding the following. Data points are secretly probability distributions. You may have seen this before. It's a data point with an error bar. If you look at it from the side, though, it's secretly a normal distribution. The dot represents its mean, and the bar represents the one sigma width. Okay, so a data point is a normal distribution. Maybe you have had that realization before. Uh, and so if you have a, a data set, a bunch of data points, they represent a bunch of uh, probability distributions. And so these are uh, independent data points. So if I've got x, y, a bunch of data points, and I've assumed they're independent here, and so here I've remapped x and y, and you can see the distribution. OK, so let's talk about how we evaluate the likelihood uh, for independent uh, data points. And we'll talk about covariant data, which are much more commonly encountered after this. So the likelihood. Uh, for independent data sets is just the individual likelihoods multiplied together. T a, a product is generally a very large number, very complicated. So it's um, common to work with the log likelihood. If you take the log of this expression, the product turns into a sum. This is much easier to work with. So we're going to be working with uh, the log likelihood. So you imagine you have five data points here. Um, I wanted to, to draw a line. Imagine you're evaluating the problem. The, your model is a straight line, and you want to uh, evaluate the gradient of that line. That's a free parameter, and you're going to try to guess what the distribution of you're trying to infer what the 
what the distribution of that parameter is. Okay? And so each of these, remember, is a, a normal distribution. So I've drawn my line through, and then for each of them, I'm going to compute um, the uh, probability of uh, the parameter value at that point given the data. So I'll give an explicit example of this in a moment. And that, for a particular parameter choice, is, is the likelihood. Does anyone have? Do I? Sorry. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, yep. Yeah, of course. I. Sorry, I will point that out. Yes. So uh, there's a typo here in the last line. This should be log, sum of log. So in particular, if our probability distributions are Gaussians, yeah, I've written a Gaussian here, uh, and I have not normalized this Gaussian properly, but I just want to focus on what's in the middle, then the log will be this expression, which is commonly encountered, I think, uh, in expressing goodness of fit for a model, given a data set. In astronomy, we call this the chi-squared, because if the data are normally distributed, this quantity is chi-squared distributed. But that's, I think, only in astronomy, and it's not good nomenclature. So in general, in evaluating likelihood, what you will do is you will take your set of data, yi, you have a model expressed here as f, for example, I had a straight line before, and it's a function of the data, but also of this parameter, the gradient, for instance. And I evaluate the likelihood of the parameter value by taking the data minus the model value at each of the points where I have a data point, divided by the error, squared. And I sum all that. Has everyone carried out a computation like that before with a data set? So maybe we don't think of it as a sort of a likelihood evaluation, but that's, that's what it is. Okay. So here's an example. Here are a bunch of data points, uh, and I've drawn the line from which the data are generated through them, but we're going to pretend we don't know what that uh, line is exactly. We're going to say it's some A1 x squared plus A2. And the goal is to infer what A1 and A2 are or to infer the probability distribution for A1 and A2 given the data. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have a model, F, of X given A1, A2. I write down my log likelihood. So I will code up a function, for instance, in Python, which evaluates the log likelihood. And then I can uh, express the likelihood in that fashion. And so if I do that, <clears throat> I'll get a plot that looks something like this. Or I may get a plot that looks something like this. And this shows me uh, how, which region of parameter space, A1, A2, uh, is best for describing the data. So in this case, there's a peak around here. You can also see that uh, the data are not, they're, they're covariant. So very often you will find that the two parameters are not independent of one another. There'll be some covariance. Do you want to say something? Um, yeah, I will. Uh, so here is a joint distribution for A1 and, and A2. Now, this is just the, the likelihood. What I want is the posterior. So maybe I have a prior distribution on what A1 and A2 are. Maybe someone did an experiment last year and they found that things were a bit broader. I had some broader error bars. Now I use this new information. I update the prior to the posterior and I have a posterior probability distribution. This is a joint distribution for A1 and A2. Okay. Now, if you're interested in A1 and A2 and the relationship between them, that is as compact a, a statement of the results as you can come up with. But very often, you might only be interested in A1. Maybe A1 represents the mass and A2 is some nuisance parameter that you're not interested in. In that case, you should marginalize over the second parameter. So integrate with respect to A2. And then what you'll end up with... It's the marginalization march. <laughs> uh, and what you might end up with, for instance, is a, a one-dimensional distribution. So if I marginalize over A2, I'm, if this is an array of values, which is what I've done, I just made a grid of A1, A2 values, and I computed the likelihood, then what I do is just sum over the uninteresting axis. And I end up with a vector which represents the likelihood. And so this 
would be, for instance, a result you quote. Here is A1, its value is 0.7, plus or minus the one sigma value of. And it's good to quote things like that in papers because then people can say, blogs et al found this, and it's much better than last year's results, but of course they didn't account for systematics, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Josh, did you want to add anything to that? Um, that plus or minus, I mean, you're apparently saying that A1 is some sort of Gaussian. Exactly. That, that distribution generally is not. Yep. Uh, so you might want to say kind of rules of thumb for what, you know, what we say when we say one sigma. Right. So, yeah, the implicit statement here is that if, if, A1, if, if the distribution of A1 is normal, then it can be completely characterised by its mean and its standard deviation. But um, the probability distribution might not be Gaussian. It okay. happens very commonly. In which case, you should plot in your paper the full distribution. That's useful information for people. Um, what you can do, though, is, is quote the plus or minus one sigma values that excise the top two-thirds of the data or whatever would be you know, the one sigma value for a Gaussian. If you want to quote a one sigma error bar, maybe familiar with that. Um, but in general, if, you're, if your probability distribution is not Gaussian, you, you, can't, you can't condense it. Okay. And so we're going to talk, yeah. I think it's good to hear about how it's <coughs> the frequentists and the Bayesian approach. Cool. So <clears throat> this, everything written up there is completely frequentist. Mm -hmm. What you get from <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. actually, I mean, if you want to evaluate, not that you should go around thinking, am I talking to a frequentist or a Bayesian right now, but yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a great point that's worth repeating. So <clears throat> to you, this is a very simple case. You could end up with a probability distribution, a joint probability distribution, for instance, that, that is a banana. We're going to see some of those in a minute. But even more difficult to handle are multimodal distributions where you don't have one single peak. And so to give a one-dimensional example... Where is the eraser? Over here. Favorite example of cosmologists is photometric redshift. If you are evaluating the redshift of some distant object based only on limited uh, photometric information, you very commonly end up with, because galaxies are complicated objects, a distribution for the redshift that might have more than one peak. And so you can say with reasonably high confidence that it's not some large range of values and that it's here or here, but you have to be able, you have to be clear that you can express, you know, it could be very close by or it could be, could be very far away, but not in between, okay? So m dealing with multimodal uh, distributions is something that, that is a difficult challenge, okay? 
So um, the case that I described a moment ago was uh, describing when your data points are uncorrelated. Commonly, you might have a data set where there's covariance between the data and that you need to account for this properly when evaluating the likelihood. So the way I think about this, here is a very limited data set, has three data points. If the data points are covariant, there are three data points, and you can think of this as being a sample from a three-dimensional multivariate normal distribution. So this data set as a whole is one point in the multivariate normal distribution. Okay? And so if I picked another point, the data set would be slightly different. And you can think of this as being a, a sample. The data set you're taking is a sample from that three-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Okay? And this is uh, evaluating the probability is then done using the probability expression for the multivariate normal distribution, which coincidentally we looked at in the breakout earlier. So the way you would um, perform the likelihood evaluation we did with uncorrelated data a moment ago with covariant data is you now have a 3 by 3 or n by n covariance matrix representing the covariance between the data points rather than error bars, sigma. And you have the mean values still, the points, a vector of mean values. So you have your vector of mean values and you have uh, a vector of model values given, I've got to put given the parameter choice. So you evaluate, you have a vector of separations and then you use the inverse covariance matrix. When the data points are uncorrelated, that is when the covariance matrix is diagonal, this expression reduces to the one we saw a couple of slides ago, y minus f of xi divided by sigma i, because the sigmas are just on the diagonal. Should I go over that again on the board, or is that something folks are familiar with, or we can talk about it uh, afterwards. So this is just a general expression for evaluating the goodness of fit or evaluating the likelihood when you have covariant data and you have an expression for their covariance. So to give an example of this, <clears throat> here is uh, an example from the Wiggles Galaxy Redshift Survey. This was published last year. What we're inferring here are a couple of cosmological parameters, the matter density in the universe and the equation of state parameter for dark energy. Uh, I don't have time to describe what these are and how they affect the data set, unfortunately. But we are inferring two cosmological parameters from uh, a measurement made uh, with the galaxy distribution. This is um, spatial scale, and this is a measure of the clustering of galaxies as a function of spatial scale. Very short scales, galaxies are very clustered, larger scales. They're basically unclustered. This bump is a very interesting feature that sadly I do not have time to talk about. So, so <laughs> bump that you're spinning there, yeah. the same size as that you're spinning up in there? <laughs> <laughs> the answer to this question, the, the, answer, the answer to this question, which we gave to the referee, is <laughs> on these scales, data points are extremely covariant. So this bump is not terribly significant. It just happens that one point is like a little bit shifted down and it's so covariant that it drags everything down. Now you could argue, well, it could be for the bump as well. And so happily, the covariance is slightly less at shorter scales. Uh, and also, we, this is just one redshift slice. So there are actually four separate data sets that are independent. Uh, that all show. No, actually, the best would be for me to put the consolidated data set. They actually, they all look pretty much the same. If I combine all of them, I stack the signal, then yeah, it looks better. Or if I wanted to use the best looking data set, I would have used the results from another Galaxy Register survey, which were re, uh, published only a few weeks ago, which are really nice. So the baryon acoustic oscillation signal is significant. That should be your take home from today. Uh. <laughs> okay. But to do uh, likelihood analysis. So this red line uh, is, say, a best fitting uh, prediction for what clustering is as a function of scale based on parameter choices for those two parameters I mentioned, the matter density and the equation of state of dark energy. And so given this data set, we want to evaluate the likelihood distribution for those two parameters. So happily, we have a covariance matrix telling us how clustered these points are at different scales. So. Um, Sorry, how covariant they are. Thank you. And in fact, this is a correlation matrix. So it just, it's like normalized so that the diagonal means perfectly correlated and this off diagonal basically goes down to a zero. So it's, it's a relatively simple covariance matrix, but you can also see it's not diagonal. So it needs to be taken into account. If you just used y minus uh, function divided by sigma, you would not get the right answer. 
Okay. So the likelihood evaluation is carried out using the expression from the previous slide. We invert the covariance matrix. Given a choice of parameters, that predicts a model. We take model difference from the data, invert the covariance matrix, evaluate the likelihood. And so here is uh, some contours, one and two probably, for the probability distributions for uh, the, the matter density parameter and the equation of state parameter. So, <coughs> pardon me. The blue is just for this experiment, for the galaxy distribution. And you can see that they're centered on a particular value. It's not a Gaussian. It's got some degeneracy. There's some correlation between. But nevertheless, it's what, uh, what we would expect to have as the output of uh, the likelihood evaluation. There are two other experiments which are quite different. The red is based on measurements of supernovae. And the black are based on measurements of the microwave background distribution. And so, in cosmology, we have three almost independent means of evaluating parameters like this. And so we are able to stack the posterior likelihood evaluations. And if we do, we stack all three of them together, we end up with something like this, which is a very compact, relatively compact. And so that's more or less the state of the art in cosmology. So if we put this to a gap, Yeah, yeah. I, I, <coughs> you can't, it's just a lot more difficult. So the way that you do it in the statistics is basically do a likelihood of ratio of deaths at each point in that parameter space, which you could do with, it's just a lot harder and more computationally difficult, I think. You can, actually, you can in fact do it, but it's, the nice thing about Bayesian statistics is that you have probability distributions, you can just find it, it just works out much easier. It's way less safe. And maybe I'm uh, overstepping a little bit here, but um, my understanding also is that your prior is that the matter density numbers can be negative, whereas the frequentness has no way, and so that winds up effectively scrunching your 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 resulting posterior uh, to make sure that it's positive. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense to have negative matter. You could inject that. In Yeah, my disallowing certain average figures or doing constrained optimization. But it's nice to have an explicit explicit probability that the probability if you want to have a flat prior goes from zero up to infinity, that's fine, but it really isn't allowed mm -hmm. to be less than mm -hmm. less than zero. Yeah, I, I think for for the interpretation, thinking of these things in terms of probability distributions makes makes it very easy. Okay. It's way more intuitive. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so that's, that's all of cosmology. No, I, I joke. Um, there are more than two parameters. Uh, and so what cosmologists do is publish uh, representations of these distributions, these joint distributions for the many cosmological parameters that, that govern the behavior of, of objects in the universe. Okay, so that I think is the end of uh, what I wanted to talk about. So the breakout is the next slide. I've just given examples involving one or two, one when I'm drawing on the, the blackboard, or two dimensions. Uh, very commonly, you will be dealing with models that have more than two dimensions. If you're like me, two is about the limit of my patience if I'm evaluating the likelihood using a grid, where I like have a grid of parameter values and I calculate the likelihood. I want cleverer methods to do that. So uh, what Joey is going to talk about is those cleverer methods. Um, there are also tools you can do without MCMC uh, to get re characterizations of particular aspects of the probability dis distribution. If you have a good reason for thinking that your probability distribution is unimodal, or better still, that it's multivariate normal, then you can characterize it fairly easily using an optimization routine, like fmin. So you put in the likelihood, you like write a Python function that returns the likelihood value given a, a set of parameters. And then you run that through fmin or fmin bfgs or something. And it will return the maximum likelihood parameter estimates. You can also get estimates of the covariance. If you're assuming it's a multivariate normal distribution, the parameter distribution, then you can return estimates of the covariance between the parameters. Uh, and so that's a common task. Uh, 
but it isn't always the case. In fact, it isn't really very often the case that you have something you're definitely sure is multivariate normal, in which case you need other methods to characterise the likelihood distribution. And that's what we'll talk about after the breakout. Okay, so here is the breakout. It will take 20 to 30 minutes. Well, we'll see how we get on. Um, I've provided a data set, which hopefully you guys can find on vSpace. It's a three-column text file, X, Y, error bar on Y. So these are not covariant data. Treat them as independent data. So write in Python a uh, model function of that form and uh, <coughs> write another function to evaluate the likelihood given a choice of parameter values. So this is in general a two-parameter function. I've, I've suggested a model that has two parameters, A and B. To begin with, just assume that B is zero. Let's do the one-dimensional case, or the one-parameter case. And so compute the likelihood for a range of parameter values. Um, find the maximum likelihood either by I or using an optimization routine, uh, and maybe plot the distribution. And so now, uh, after you've done that, maybe you can imagine that I tell you now that a previous experiment told me that the probability distribution for A is a normal distribution with mean this value and with that value, and then plot how you update that prior with your new information to give a posterior. You're just multiplying things. Uh, and then there's an extension. Of course, you've done it with just one parameter, but you could do it with two. So plot the joint distribution of A and B and maybe the marginal distribution of A. Maybe B is an un uninteresting parameter that you need to marginalise over. Okay, so that is the breakout.
So let's go through uh, quickly, uh, not the solution to the exact problem I gave, but an example of doing this in research. This is taken from my own research where I'm evaluating um, the distribution for a cosmological parameter, the density parameter that we mentioned earlier based on uh, some uh, data that I've measured from a galaxy redshift survey. Okay, so most of this notebook, which if people are interested I can post, is uh, about building up the model. So in, this, in the breakout problem, the model is very simple, uh, very often in cosmology and in other science sure the model is not simple. So most of the notebook is um, generating the model. But the, the actual um, likelihood evaluation is relatively straightforward. So here I have loaded the data set. It has 36 data points. Those are their values. This is the covariance matrix. It's not trivial. Um, it's got a funny shape because it's a funny combination of different data sets. So some are covariant and some are not. What this is, this is a separate, I'm just demonstrating how I would implement a, a solution to this problem. Sorry? What are the data points? What do they represent? Yeah, what, what are they? Clustering as a function of scale. They, okay. <laughs> it's something different to that, but it could be that, <laughs> for instance. Um, Okay, but but I yeah, but I want to I want to highlight the, the like at an abstract level. This is what you are doing is extremely generic. There is a data set. There is a covariance matrix. There's some models. Then I write a function, the log likelihood function, which takes in uh, the <laughs> the yes, thank you, um, which takes in the data, the covariance matrix, and the parameter estimates and returns a log likelihood value and then uh, so uh, this returns so in this case it's a two parameter two parameter vector the matter density and the equation of state parameter for those two parameters generate a model that's this vector compare it to the data and then the covariance matrix I've stored as a numpy array and this evaluates the log likelihood if so Let's look at the commented line above because it's clearer. This is just a numerical trick which I won't talk about. I take delta times the inverse covariance matrix times the transpose. This returns the same thing but it's more numerically stable. Okay, and so that's a function that defines the likelihood. So hopefully several of you wrote something that was similar in spirit to that. And then once you have that, you can evaluate your likelihood in a number of different ways. We'll be talking about MCMC in a moment or because it's simple, just use a grid of values. And so here I define a grid of values and for a grid of values for one of the parameters and evaluate uh, the likelihood, I get a plot. It's not quite Gaussian, it has a funny bump. That's interesting. Uh, and then from this I can estimate the mean value and the width of the distribution. And that's nevertheless. Sorry? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again. Yeah, exactly. No, no, it's, it's not normalization. It's because the model is not a terribly good fit to the data. That's something that has to be grappled with. Uh, it happens. It's, it's actually several of the data points are extremely deviant from the model. But mo it's a good fit to three quarters of the data, and then one quarter of the data is not good. That would be, that would, or the model is bad. Can interpret that two ways. <laughs> okay, so the, I guess the only other thing to comment on here is estimating the width of the distribution. So finding the peak is done by I or using fmin. Um, here I've estimated the width just by noting that if you calculate the values of the likelihood or if you compare the values of the log likelihood at several different points, you can estimate the value of sigma. And that works in higher dimensions as well. So this is a common way of estimating the covariance matrix. Um, and as I discussed with some people, there are routines within Python, uh, within Optimize, the least squares, at least SQ routine can return an estimate of the covariance matrix as well as the likelihood peak. Okay, do anyone have any questions? 
comments about my research? Okay, so we're going to continue the discussion of uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, thanks to Barry for the nice introduction. Makes my discussion a little bit easier. And uh, please ask a lot of questions, uh, especially for those of you who aren't experienced with uh, Bayesian inference uh, or these types of statistical methods. So as we kind of discussed before, the goal of Bayesian inference is to try to produce the posterior probability distribution over, over the, the parameters of interest. So in Bayesian inference, we treat the parameters as random variables that have distributions. And uh, that's really nice because if we knew the posterior dis distributions perfectly, estimating the parameters and their unlikely, and their uh, uh, and their uncertainty is, is extremely easy. If you have the whole distribution, you know it's mean, you know it's median, you know it's uh, you know central 95% region, and all statistical inferences are really kind of trivial once you have the the posterior. Opposed this to frequentist statistics, where we treat the parameters as fixed and the data as as random, and now you're kind of always trying to compare a fixed parameter with a new realization of your data and trying to come up with confidence intervals or doing hypothesis tests and things like that. So in a way, it's, uh, I find thinking about Bayesian statistics a lot more intuitive. Um, I think a lot of the, the, the differences uh, in different fields is, is based on how people conceptualize their data and their parameters and for instance, in, in cosmology, I think there's often a lot of prior information about your parameters and that, that information and those, in, uh, and those uh, supposed or assumed distributions are really powerful in trying to constrain uh, the posterior, so the, the value of the parameter given the data. So as Barian said, our main tool uh, and Bayesian inference is Bayes' theorem, where we have uh, the prior uh, distribution of our, of, uh, of our parameters uh, given some modeling uh, prior information, uh, which is updated via the likelihood, which is the probability of data uh, given parameters, to give us our posterior, which is the, probability, the updated probability of our parameters given the data. Uh, right, so like I said before, contrast this to the, the classical statistics where the parameters are fixed, the data are random, and then all statistical inferences are just hypothetical repeated experiments. So frequentists uh, like to talk about coverage, which is basically if you were to have repeated experiments, what percent of the inferred uh, parameters from those repeated data uh, are actually covered by your confidence interval. And that's kind of like, for frequentists, that's the, the thing you're after. Whereas in Bayesian statistics, you're worried more about the distribution of your parameters given your data. Okay. 
Now, so for, for Bayesian inference, the, really the challenge is finding the posterior distribution. Once you have your posterior, all inference is really trivial. You just have, you have your entire distribution of your, of your parameters, so then, and, and presumably the parameters are the things that you're interested in. So you can take the mean, you can take standard deviation, you can look at uh, the central, you know, 95% credible sets. But getting the posterior is the, the challenge. So the simplest case is, so say we have some likelihood, uh, you know, a probability of data given parameters. Simplest case is to just assume what's called a conjugate prior, which is the prior that gives us a closed form solution uh, to the posterior distribution. Uh, so, for example, if our likelihood is indeed normal or Gaussian, here we've assumed that we, we know the variance. So we've assumed that this is fixed and known. And so uh, our parameter of interest here is mu. So this is just shorthand for probability of data given the parameter. So that's our likelihood. If we assume a normal prior on mu, so if we assume that mu is drawn from some normal distribution with hyperparameters mu naught and sigma naught squared, then there's actually a closed form to our posterior. It's simply this normal distribution. And you see that both the prior uh, hyperparameters, so the, the prior distribution of mu, as well the as the data come into play in updating our knowledge about mu. So it's actually really, it's really natural. It's, it's, it's kind of a weighted average between your prior belief and what the data tell you. And as you collect more data, kind of this, this term, the term with the x's in it, and the term with the n's in it, start to dominate over your prior. So in the, actually in the, in the limit that you collect an infinite amount of data, you essentially converge to what frequentist statistics, the maximum likelihood would tell you. But if you have ver very little amount of information, then your prior belief kind of takes over. So you're always kind of walking between those two regimes. And there's, there's so th these conjugate forms exist for a lot of different uh, likelihoods. If you just go into Wikipedia and type in conjugate prior, there's like dozens and dozens of likelihoods that have nice simple conjugates. So this is kind of the, the simplest form imaginable. Right. Yeah. So that, that's certainly uh, that's certainly a good point. That why restrict yourself to having a normal prior rate? Normal, right? I mean, normal prior is very. Common. I don't think it's bad, but for some mm -hmm. other distribution, if you're likely to do something else, why pick some? Certainly. Prior? Yeah. The question is, so why pick anything? Right. There's there's some sort of knowledge in the background, and, and actually, there's a huge field of statistics called elicitation of priors, which is based on all the knowledge that I have before seeing the data, what is my best guess and how do I actually write a distribution out for doing that? So there's like this whole subfield about questioning the experts to try to come up with the, the best prior possible. But typically, in, in whenever you do Bayesian statistics, you want to check the, re, the, the, re, the sensitivity of your, of your inferences to the, the assumed prior. If you don't do that, then you don't know if your prior is driving the results or the data. So uh, posterior predictive checks and, and uh, sensitivity of prior is really important things to look at. OK, so for more complex models and realistic settings and realistic models, uh, conjugate priors don't exist. Or you might not want to assume a conjugate prior like, like Varian says. <coughs> So in this setting, the exact computation of the posterior distribution is impossible, and we have to, to do sampling techniques. So instead of actually writing down the functional form of our posterior distribution, we're going to try to take a sample from the posterior. And then with that sample, we can do all of our inferences. So we can take the mean of the sample with respect to each parameter, uh, look at the, the variances, uh, confidence intervals, whatever. Okay, so there's, there's lots of different MCMC techniques out there. Uh, probably this, one of the simpler ones is called Gibbs sampling, where we assume 
some conjugacy uh, in in our uh, in our likelihoods in our likelihood and and prior. Uh, specifically that given some subset of the parameters, so let's say we have a vector of parameters that we're interested in, given some subset of that, there is conjugacy. So you can write down what the posterior of that, sub, of that subset, given the, the rest of the parameters plus the data. And likewise for the other subset. You basically, you can iterate back and forth sampling uh, theta one through theta p, so your, your entire uh, parameter set is theta 1 through the theta k. And you can iterate sampling a subset of the parameters given the other subset, and vice versa. And you keep iterating this until you, you converge. This is uh, kind of the simplest MCMC sampler out there. And it doesn't have to be just two uh, subsets. It can be k subsets. It can be any, any number of iterations. <coughs> of that. Um, so th this is this is nice and it, it converges quite quickly. There's lots of problems where you, where you can actually write this down, but it usually takes a lot of writing out math and uh, you know making sure your terms are correct. And the, the pain is more on the not on the implementation, but uh, or not uh, the running of the algorithm, but the writing down the exact formula, updating formula uh, for doing the sampling. Uh, so there's also probably the, the more commonly used MCMC is Metropolis Hastings and variants of that. And here you basically take a random walk through your through your parameter space, and at each uh, uh, at each uh, so what do they call it? There's a there's a there's a proposal density. So you start somewhere in your parameter space, you jump via proposal density, and then you look at that particular parameter, compute the likelihood and the prior for that parameter, so then your, your posterior is just a multiplication of those two, and compare that to where you were. And if the, the, like, if the posterior probability has gone up, you take that step, and if it hasn't, you take that step with a certain probability. And this is proven to converge to the posterior under, uh, you know, Certain scenarios. So if you if you just take this uh, this random walk through your, through this market, this uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain random walk through your data set, uh, you are more or less for most situations or for some situations going to converge to the true posterior distribution of your parameters. Uh, so I'll, I'll show in the breakout session, but yeah, maybe the banana will, will work. So assume that, that this is our this is our two-dimensional parameter space, and this is our and this is the actual uh, posterior. So it's our probability of the parameters given x. So what an MCMC Metropolis Hastings algorithm will, will do is you start somewhere. It's so actually same same thing with with Gibbs sampling, but uh, Gibbs sampling knows the exact form of say p theta one given theta two and x, and p theta two given theta one and x. So you can actually sample. You basically take the marginal likelihood of this, sample from that, and then uh, vice versa. So you you quickly converge to in here. In the, where, the, where there's uh, a lot of density, and you'll just kind of randomly walk around this area and, and sample from that, that posterior. Uh, so there's, there's always a burn-in phase. So you're going to start basically some random area in this parameter space and start random walking until you're actually truly capturing that density. And you typically throw away that, 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 that burn-in stage. OK, so Metropolis Hastings. You typically take uh, just Gaussian proposal density uh, distributions. So here we have a, we'd have if this was our initial value, so call it theta zero, our initial guess at the parameters. We'll we'll draw another parameter value from some density, 
we'll check the likelihood, the posterior density here versus here. If it's greater, we'll move to that. If it's less, we t probably won't move there. And little by little, we'll converge to the posterior. Uh, so it's it's something that you can set manually. Typically, you just use a like a Gaussian. Oh, sorry. It's telling you given your current, given your your last uh, parameter value, uh, what's the next? What's the? We're gonna jump somewhere. Yeah. Where do we, where do we want to go? So the, the, the proposal is just, where are we going to go next? We're going to go somewhere. Uh, and there's actually a tuning parameter in all of this, and how far are we going to jump? Are we going to try to jump over here? Are we going to try to jump very close? And that you kind of want to tune that to get the appropriate number of rejections and accepted steps. Uh, Baring brought up a good point, though, is that uh, Metropolis-Hastings is not just a, a hill climbing algorithm. So many algorithms will just go to the the highest point and stay there, whereas Metropolis Hastings can go downhill, so it doesn't just go to the maximum of the of the posterior. It can actually come down. Uh, it can go here. It can come down. It can go back, and in that way, it actually it does sample the appropriately samples the entire density, not just focusing on the the maximum of that. That's yeah. And at each step, how are you getting the posterior? So you can you can compute that. So if you have the likelihood in the prior. Right, there's a closed form to the likelihood. There's a closed form to the prior. What there's not is a closed form to the posterior. So at any at any given parameter, you can actually perfectly compute the prior density, perfectly compute the likelihood. That's that's kind of the whole point. We can't just write down a form for the posterior, but we can sample from it. Yeah, so once the chain converges, that's true. Mm -hmm. So at your initial point, no, right? right. But once you, once you converge, so there's properties of, of Markov chains that, you know, if it's er ergodic, then you get to the solution and you've converged, and then you'll, you'll always stay uh, sampling from that uh, exact density. It's determined by the... It's determined by the ratio of your posteriors. Okay. So if you have one, one uh, parameter value and another one, you can compute the, the posterior density for each of those points. And then it's the ratio of that, which, which is the probability that you'll take the step. So it's the ratio of the new posterior over the old posterior. So if that's greater than one, you always take the step. If it's less than one, you take that step with whatever that probability is. Okay, good. Any other questions on these sorts of sampling techniques? Okay. So the nice thing is that with Python, and particularly PyMC, we don't have to think too hard about constructing these samplers. They have really nice implementations. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to put in really complicated probability models and uh, do posterior sampling from those. Uh, we can do hierarchical models, which we'll see on the homework. Uh, there's also convergence diagnostics. So you want to know if your chain is actually converged to some steady state, to the actual posterior. And there's a, there's a, you know, a handful of diagnostics that have been included with uh, PyMC. Um, also tuning. So with Metropolis Hastings, there's a tuning parameter, which is the, the width of your proposal density. And they have some automatic routines of choosing that to get the appropriate uh, uh, rejection ratio. So you, there's kind of these rules of thumb that you don't want to accept every jump, or else, because that means you're not jumping far enough. But you don't want to reject too many, because that means you're jumping too far. 
So there's kind of a sweet spot that you want uh, to be in to make the, uh, the MCMC converge faster. Uh, and there's really nice documentation, so go ahead, go ahead and look at their, their website. Okay, so let's see how we can build a model with PyMC. So I've taken this data set of uh, coal mining disasters in the UK. So this is a time series where uh, every year from 1850 to 1960, they recorded how many coal mining disasters there were. And we want to use this data. So it seems here that it's kind of like maybe it was pretty high up to some point, and then it's like pretty low after that. So it looks like at some point there was a switch. Something happened maybe around here to change from like not very safe mining conditions to safer mining conditions. Uh, so let's try to estimate when that change occurred and maybe the, the magnitude of that change in terms of accidents, disasters per year. So we can write that down as a statistical model. Um, so our likelihood here is Poisson. So Poisson is a kind of a, a counting likelihood. It's a discrete likelihood. So it gives you the probability uh, that some number between 0, 1, 2, 3, out to infinity occurs within a, a time window. Uh, and it's parameterized by this rate. So the rate here is number of disasters per year. And so if we draw a Poisson random variable, it'll give us how many disasters occur on a, uh, a given year. Uh, so now we, we model the rate function as some value before time s and some other value after time s, meaning the rate was somewhere until s, and then sometime s happens, and then the rate changes to something else. That's kind of what I described before. So then with, you know, if we, if we knew the parameters e, l, and s, then we could we would know exactly when that change occurred and what the magnitude of that, of that change was. So in, uh, in Bayesian inference, we have probability distributions over our parameters. So we need to specify prior. Uh, so before seeing any data, what's our prior belief about the uh, values of, of the parameters? So here for S, we've just chosen a discrete uniform distribution. So that basically says there's equal probability of falling anywhere from, 19, from 1850 to 1960. Seems sensible. We don't want to inject our, before seeing this data, we don't want to assume it happened some place more than another place. And then for E and L, which are these, these different rate functions, we've shown it, chosen an exponential. So exponential uh, has pretty nice properties uh, with uh, in terms of modeling rates. So they're constrained to be uh, positive. And uh, depending on what parameters, so these are hyperparameters, R, E, and R, L. Depending on what parameters you put in there, we can give more or less weight to, to low or higher values. Okay, any, any questions about this model? So this is our statistical model. It's definitely not Gaussian. <laughs> okay, so how do we code up such a model in PyMC? Uh, there's a file on BSpace called disastermodel.py, which has this code in there. So uh, within PyMC, the, there's lots of different distributions. Uh, we have discrete uniform. So to specify, uh, to instantiate a random variable s, which is our, our parameter for the change time, it's as easy as just this one line of code. PyMC discrete, discrete uniform s, which is the name of the variable, and then a lower and upper bound. So here, it's 0 to 110. but plus 1850 or whatever. It's, it's not too important. And then same with E and L. Uh, we've chosen to be exponential. And here we've we fixed beta. So beta is the, the parameter in the exponential. We've assumed to be 1. So if you go back here, this is beta. So here they're just written as RE and RL. 
we're going to say RE and RRL are both 1. And that's a relatively uninformative prior on E and L. It looks something like, this is E, looks something like, like this, where, you know, maybe it gets low, like around 8 or 10, but it, uh, it's basically telling our, our rate, it's probably more likely to be lower, but uh, it could be pretty high. It's relatively uninformative. And we'll see, actually, that uh, even though we, we assume our prior belief on ENL is that they follow the same distribution, our posterior will show that they're, in fact, very different. <coughs> okay, and then uh, we also have this R, uh, this variable R, which is E if we're less than S and L if we're greater than S, a time greater than S. And the way that we instantiate that in PyMC is by using this PyMC deterministic. And this essentially means that when we do all the sampling in PyMC, we're not going to sample R, because R is completely determined by other parameters. It's not random. If we know S, E, and L, then R is just a simple function of them. Uh, okay. And then finally, we have our likelihood. So again, it's a Poisson likelihood. Uh, D is our data, so it's just a vector of number of accidents per year. The, the mean of that Poisson is R, which is our rate. And then uh, PyMC doesn't really make a distinction between likelihoods and priors, except that if you say observed equals true, it means we've actually observed data following this distribution, D. And we have to put the value of that data in here. So the disasters array is just the, 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 the data array. How would you specify <coughs> uncertainty? So those rates are <coughs> the value of these is three and a number of seven or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. two, two, four. So you'd have to use a more complex model. Um, Well, no, but so so basically, at the heart of it, it wouldn't be Poisson. Poisson, uh, it wouldn't be Poisson. Yeah, right. That's what I mean. Yeah, it would be IMC normal. Right. Well, but it wouldn't be normal either because Poisson is discrete. I mean, our okay, counts are discrete. Is, is probably, yeah. Yeah. Right. But yeah, so you use a different likelihood because Poisson assumes that the the variance is is also so mu and, and the variance are the same in the Poisson. But there are other uh, distributions out there that you could use. Yeah, basically, the whole model would be different. There'd be like probably a few more parameters. OK, so how do we fit this model? So by fit, I mean, how do we sample the posterior for all of these parameters of interest? It's pretty easy. We just import. So this is saved in <coughs> some .py file. We import that. Uh, we import mcmc from pymc, and then we instantiate this mcmc. Uh, variable m. <coughs> so let's uh, let's do that. Let's see all the cool stuff we can do. Um, okay. Let's see if I can go full screen. How's that look? Okay, so here we're just, uh, again, instantiating the model. So we've imported disaster model. Here's our MCMC object. Uh, okay, that seemed to work. Uh, so PyMC also has this uh, really uh, cool graphing uh, function where we can actually visualize our model as a graphical model. And I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a second, but if I just uh, run this line of code with the model, uh, it saves a PNG file or any type of file that you want. And I, I just then read in the file to plot it. So this is our model. Um, <coughs> any questions? What's the difference between an ellipse and a triangle? Yeah, so an ellipse, so, so L, E, and S are parameters. The ellipse means that this is some prior distribution over that parameter. It's related to R through the value of that 
parameter. R is not random. It's determined completely by L, E, and S, which is why it's a triangle, I guess, with L, E, and S pointing in. And then based on what R is, uh, R produces the data through this mu, which is our mean function on the Poisson. And D is shaded in because we've observed it, its actual data. Um, there's some really cool examples in the PyMC documentation of these just crazy graphical models. But anyone who's doing really hardcore Bayesian modeling is thinking about all of these in terms of graphical models. It's a good way of keeping track of what's random, what's, what, what's not random, what's observed, how things relate to one another. And uh, it's a good way to check that your model is actually right. Okay, so uh, when we instantiate this disaster model, it just gives, uh, it starts with some uh, kind of arbitrary values of each of the parameters. Um, but we can actually draw samples from the posterior using m dot sample. So m again was our MCMC object. And here I've, so we're using the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, and I've said take 10,000 samples, throw away the first thousand because it, I'm thinking it's not going to converge immediately. And then this thinning parameter means you don't take every single sample, but you throw away every second one. And that's to try to minimize kind of the auto covariance in your samples because you're taking these, uh, you might be taking very small uh, jumps in this parameter space. So there's going to be quite high correlation between one value and the next. Um, there are people that argue that that doesn't matter. There are some people who say that it matters a lot. Uh, it's typically safer. Take the average of those two. Yeah, exactly. To throw away a few, especially if it's so here, it's like the likelihood calls are instantaneous. So um, you can also use I sample, which does interactive uh, sampling, where you can kind of stop, restart the sampler, do other things like mid mid sample. Like if you're doing something that was really computationally intensive, you might want to stop it and realize that your model is wrong and change things and then go back. Okay, so that ran pretty quickly. Uh, we can look at summary statistics from that run and we get a lot of information. Uh, so here we have each of our parameters, E, L, um, R, which is of course this giant vector. Um, <laughs> this is all information on R and S. And so, uh, yeah, we get things like, uh, what's the mean? Oops. Uh, uh, how many samples did we take? Uh, what are all the quantiles? What's the standard deviation? Uh, all useful stuff. So we can plot what's called the trace of the sampler, which is just plot all of these samples of the parameter s as a function of the MCMC MC iteration. And we see that within the first 1,500 or so iterations, we certainly were not converged. We were kind of bouncing all over the place. And at some point, we converge and we are just kind of steady state for the rest of the chain. So this tells me that we need to, to burn in longer. We need to burn in until we're pretty confident that we've reached the actual posterior distribution. Before this value, we certainly have not reached that distribution because we're kind of lost in this parameter space looking for the right, right posterior. And at some point, we latch onto it. And then the, by the properties of the MCMC, we just, uh, we're good. We're, we're going to stay here always. Okay, any questions? So I need to go back up and burn in for longer. So 4,000. And it takes a little while, okay. So now let's see. Ah, perfect. So here are samples of S as a function of MCMC MC iteration. If we want to draw inferences about S, we would basically collapse all these samples onto the y-axis, and that would give us a distribution over S. Okay. Um, 
So, so I've, I've done this, so we, I do this here for L. So L is one of the other parameters. Just taking the histogram of the, all of the samples in L. And then on top of it, I've plotted what the posterior mean is, so the mean of that, as well as the uh, 2.5 and 97.5 quantiles. So that gives us a 95% credible set for the, for the, the, the true value of, of L. So this is what it looks like. So here, I, kind of the conclusion that I can say is that, you know, with 95% probability, L is between 0.7 and 1.2 disasters per year, with a mean of 0.9. Three years old. Disasters per year. I wonder what a disaster is. Um, there could be other things. Yeah, maybe our model is not rich enough to include all the effects. <coughs> okay, so within PyMC we also have our own plotting functionality. Uh, this map plot. So this map plot lives in PyMC. The matplot.plot uh, will just plot all of these uh, good things for each of the parameters of interest. So here's the trace of E and the posterior distribution of E. Same for S and for L. Well, S is discrete. S is a year. <coughs> So I it's think there's some sort of. It doesn't know whether it's 36 or 41. Yeah, so it's the year yeah. I think I think that's why you see this kind of weird pattern. Sorry. Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. <coughs> um, you can surely show the covariance. You can plot one trace with the other. Yeah. I'm just wondering in this dot plot. There's something in here. <coughs> it doesn't look like it. No, but you can plot, you can do a scatter plot of one trace versus another. Yes, yeah, so, so that's, this is my, my next plot actually. So this is plotting E versus S. And we see a little bit of anti-correlation, which if you look back to the original data, I think kind of makes sense. So here we're in like the range of three, 0.25 disasters per year. This, so E was the, the pre-switch disasters per year. <coughs> and here's the, age, the change point in year plus 1850. Oops. <coughs> so as our change point gets uh, more into the future, the E is actually smaller, which kind of makes sense because it seems like it is getting lower with, with the year. Um, Okay, so th these are all of the inferences that we can do. We can easily take posterior means and credible intervals. So here, uh, our posterior mean is for the year of change point is 1890. Um, credible interval goes from 1886 to 1896. Note that it's not symmetric around 1890. Uh, here, I want to look at the posterior mean of the magnitude of the change. So how many disasters per year are we preventing after 1890? And 2.12 is the mean. Uh, credible set is kind of between 1.5 and 2.75. So that's a significant number of disasters that we're preventing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this was the original data. And one really neat thing about Bayesian inference is that we can now draw realizations of our data uh, from our MCMC sample. So each, each parameter vector in MCMC space gives us a full model. Uh, so we could, here I've just taken the first 250 MCMC samples, and you can just plot all the models. So these were, these are draws from the posterior distribution of our models. And kind of, gives you a really n nice idea about what is going on in, in this model parameter space. Like here there's a, 
quite a lot of uh, spread in this E parameter. And here there's much less. And you can see all the correlations. So if, it, if this change point happens you know, later, then maybe it's higher in this one, or I guess it would be lower in this one. But yeah. OK. Um, I guess I just wanted to touch on a couple other things. So any, any questions about that, any of that? OK. Um, so diagnostics are a really important part of doing MCMC. We, we want to be sure that we've actually converged to the true posterior. Um, so the, the first check that I would suggest doing is starting multiple chains from different starting values and ensuring that they do indeed converge to the same place. And there are different statistics that are, are commonly used in, in the literature to, to, to test convergence of multiple chains. Then uh, there are more formal methods. Uh, in the notebook, I think I showed the result of one of those. Um, and then uh, finally, goodness of fit. So uh, kind of posterior predict predictive checks, which kind of tests not only have we converged, but also is the model kind of good enough to actually reproduce the data. So there's, if you look in PyMC, there's a lot of literature in, uh, in their manual about all these techniques. OK, so uh, I think PyMC is pretty great, but there's a lot of other MCMC code out there. Um, uh, in Python, Bayesian inference uh, I think is not as good as PyMC, but it might have some functionality or some different models that are not included in PyMC. Um, MC is pretty pretty recent. It's so there's there's lots of different samplers out there. Metropolis Hastings is one, and there's different versions of that in in uh, PyMC. But there are other ones that try to do more efficient sampling of uh, really complicated posterior distributions, multimodal distributions, and so there's there's lots of code out there to look at. Um, in R, there's a lot of things too. Some of these have really particular models that um, are included that might be difficult to code yourself, but it's usually pretty application specific. Okay, um, so I guess I'll introduce the homework now. So we'll be modeling batting averages for baseball players. And this is kind of a, a neat example about how Bayesian fitting can give you a pretty reasonable answer where typical maximum likelihood is just a terrible estimate. And uh, so the, the, the setup is that, OK, so for those who don't know, the batting average for a hitter is the total number of hits that the hitter has made divided by the number of times at bat. So yeah, in cricket, it's probably different. I don't know. Barry can maybe tell us. <coughs> um, so here, number of hits is xi, number of bats is ni. And our task is to estimate a hitter's true batting average, which I call mu i, over the entire season from the first month of data. So we get to see the hitter's performance for one month. And we want to estimate what the batting average at the end of the year will be, assuming that that hitter has the same uh, aptitude throughout the entire season. So uh, a, a good way of modeling that is with this likelihood that the number of hits given some mu i is bion binomial with mean mu i and number of, so sorry, p, mu, so mu here is the probability of success at any given at bat. So the probability of hit during a single at bat. Ni is the number of events. So this is basically telling us that uh, the implicit assumptions of, of the binomial is that mu is unchanging and that the different at-bats are independent. <clears throat> so it's a relatively simple model. Maybe it's not the most realistic thing, but it works relatively well. Uh, right, so Ni is the number of at-bats, Xi is the number of hits. Um, 
In these data files, you'll find that information for the month of April and then for the entire season. So to instantiate this uh, in PyMC, it's quite simple. And so your task is, uh, I think, three things. So first is to find the maximum likelihood estimate of mu i for each player. So just so all of this is just given the April stats. So only using the data in uh, LA 2001 April.txt. <coughs> Um, the hint is that this takes a simple closed form, which it's the mean. <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously a terrible estimate because if you, if you see someone batting for 10 at bats and they get five hits, you can't assume that they're going to bat that well the, the whole season because we have prior information about how well people typically bat. Yes? Yeah, very few people in the data sets? Yeah. No. Um, in the world. So few people ever bat 500 over the entire season. Well, I know that, but shouldn't that be represented somewhere in the supply data? Because if you gave this to a Martian. It's, it's uh, in B, I. I or somebody who only knew. So in B, I, I, I tell you. OK, so in part B, we'll find a posterior mean of each mu i. So each player has a mu i. Each player has an aptitude, right? But now we assume a beta, beta prior over the mu i's. So that mu i has, follows some distribution. And, OK, so that, that beta encodes our prior knowledge about baseball batting averages. And alpha and beta control the mean and the variance of that. So, so a, be, a beta distribution is uh, restricted to be between 0 and 1. It's a continuous distribution. But it can take on different um, means and, and variances based on the values of alpha and beta. So just look at Wikipedia to figure out what the appropriate alpha and beta parameters are to get a mean batting average around 0.25 with a variance on order, or sorry, standard deviation. Sorry, this should be standard deviation on order of like 0.05. Like typically people. Most people bat between 2.2 and 0.3. Okay, so, so in B, we're basically uh, modeling this parameter mu i for each player um, as a, following a beta distribution with fixed parameters. In part C, we're actually going to take that a step further and put a prior on each of the hyperparameters alpha and beta. So, kind of one level up, we now have probability alpha given two other parameters, R and S, following, some, following a gamma distribution. Um, and here, I don't give you values of R and S and U of V, so just kind of pick some and see what happens, I guess. So this is, this is a hierarchical Bayesian model. So you can think of it as, in terms of the graphical model, now instead of having a mu i point to every player, we go one level up, and we have an R, no, sorry, alpha and beta pointing to the mu i, and then R, S, and U, V pointing to the alpha and the beta. So it's hierarchical because we now we have several layers of parameters and hyperparameters, each having its own distribution. OK, any questions? <clears throat> uh, so, okay. So, in terms of conjugacy, actually, I shouldn't tell you this, but B is conjugate. So, there's a closed form solution to the posterior given a beta prior, okay. if that makes sense. If you if you know beta and you know it's a binomial likelihood, then you have the closed form solution for your posterior. That's not the case for here. Having gamma priors on alpha and beta, there's no closed form solution. If you wrote it all in math, it wouldn't get you to any usable distribution. So you'll certainly have to use MCMC in this one. That one you should. But 
you don't have to. You can, you can figure out what the posterior is. Okay, so the point of the assignment then is to plot uh, each versus the full season batting average for, for each player. The MLE from part A, the posterior mean from part B, and then the posterior mean for part C. And you'll see which ones are better or worse estimates. So here I'm assuming that mu i is kind of standing in for the season-long batting average for that, for that player. Um, and then additionally, what's your posterior mean for alpha and beta in part C? So the neat thing here is that whereas for part B, you have to fix alpha and beta just based on your knowledge that the mean is 0.25 and the the, the standard deviation is 0.05. Here we can actually infer what the appropriate posterior mean for alpha and beta are without having to choose a value for that. Okay, any questions? All right.